Welcome to Tamra Talks, brought to you by the Torrance Art Museum Advocates. I'm Janine Madden, current Tamra president, and I'd like to thank you for watching. Today, we will be discussing work which is currently on view in the main gallery at the Torrance Art Museum in a show called Western Values. Western Values explores the ideas of the Old West, its history, its misconceptions, and its tropes, and aims to re-examine how the West can be visually interpreted now in terms of both its historical import and its contemporary alignments through a diverse range of contemporary art practices. The exhibition is on view through March for, uh, 2nd. 2024, and the museum is located at 3320 Civic Center Drive in Torrance, California. It's open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Admission is free and donations are gratefully accepted. This discussion is being recorded and we will post it to our YouTube channel with all of our previous TAMA talks. You can access it from our website, www.tamadvocates.com. Today, we are joined by artist Edie Winograd, yes? Winograd. Winograd, <laughs> who has four pieces in this show in the main gallery. So congratulations. Uh, she is an artist primarily working in photography and video. She began her photographic journey by learning black and white darkroom photography as a teenager in her rural hometown in Northern California. While pursuing her undergraduate degree at the University of California, Santa Cruz, she majored in environmental studies, but remained committed to art, creating photographs, films, paintings, and sculptures, and continuing her practice in San Francisco through the early 1990s. She then relocated to New York City and earned an MFA in photography and related media from the School of Visual Arts. While there, she commenced her exploration of, phot of photographing and darkroom printing in color, also beginning a many years long transition from film to digital photography. Her current body of work focuses on human perceptions and experiences within the landscape, examining their historical significance. Her work has been showcased in solo and group exhibitions nationwide, including prominent arts venues and museums, such as Artists Space and the International Center of Photography in New York, the Aldridge Contemporary Art Museum in Connecticut, the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver, and the Aspen Art Museum, all located in Colorado, where she now resides. Her work is found in both private and public collections, including the Denver Art Museum's permanent photography collection and the art collection at the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan. Um, Buenigrade has earned numerous awards, including artists' grants and artists' residencies. She currently resides and works in Denver, Colorado, and is represented by the Robichon Gallery in Denver and the Front Room Gallery in Hudson, New York. So welcome so much, Edie. We're so, so excited for you to chat with us today about your work in general and also the pieces that you have at the Torrance Art Museum. So four pieces in the main gallery is kind of a big deal. So congrats. Yeah, it looks great too. I went to the opening reception and it looks fantastic. The whole show is really, really interesting. Great, great. Well, um, the, the image, uh, I snagged it from uh, from Facebook, but yeah. someone picture, has a picture. Yeah, my brother took it. <laughs> and you're, you're in a really sweet spot at the gallery, too, in that gallery where, um, you know, you can get both walls. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, they did a great job. And so you have some images that you're going to share with us sure. today. Sure. Yeah, I'll pull up my screen. This is one of the photographs from the exhibition. Uh, I thought I'd start with a few of my sightseeing series works that were in the exhibition. And uh, the series is called Sightseeing and uh, it's kind of based on the idea of sightseeing and the impetus for people to go out and explore their surroundings. Um, some of the reasons why people visit uh, certain iconic or obscure sites. Uh, it's usually an experience of, I like to think of it as an experience of history in the landscape that pulls people out to these places. 
And what I'm interested in photographically speaking beyond the, the sites themselves and what people are looking at is the experience that people are having in those surroundings. Uh, as much as photography can really show us you know, what, what somebody might be thinking about or doing as they're uh, looking at these, these um, places. Uh, but the first four are uh, images that were in the uh, Western Values or are in the Western Values ex exhibition. This one is uh, from Canyon de Chez in Northern Arizona. And it's a very famous, well-known site. It's been photographed by a lot of photographers going way back to the beginning of photography in the United States, um, geologic survey expeditions. And it's, uh, it's definitely a draw to see these ancient ruins um, and have an experience of this incredibly deep canyon that uh, really can't even see the top of or even close to it in this image. So uh, people come down here and what they would you know, find is this site and feel like they're having this relatively um, untouched uh, experience. But of course there is a fence that is keeping them away from you know, climbing on these important ruins or anything like that. But what I noticed about this scene um, that kind of drew me to it in terms of this series was that little stump that's sitting in front of the fence where uh, people would come in and if they wanted to get a photograph, a nice pristine photograph, like they were the first explorer, uh, you know, on the geologic survey going across the country to, to come across this and have that sort of feeling they might climb on the stump and get the picture without the fence. Um, I'm interested in the fence and the stump and just having this more um, realistic uh, experience of how the the view is kind of packaged for people who travel to these places. Um, so another one, let's see if I can get this to advance. There you we kinda, go. You kind of hit on a really good point there, which is the yeah. idea that we think when you're standing on that stump and you maybe lift your camera above the fence line that you're getting this sort of natural thing. But I think it's important to keep the fence in there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It does. It you know, I'm, uh, it, it's more about the experience of the place than trying to replicate, um, you know, a view that that many people have already had. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, and I'm drawn to these places myself. I'm interested in that experience. I want to go there. I'm I'm a tourist just like everybody else. Uh, but when I go, I'm kind of waiting for a moment <laughs> or something to happen that's going to kind of take it more towards the experience of the place than than the place itself. And uh, it's interesting. I did start out with these two that don't have any people in them. But um, yeah, a lot of times that is more about the people. But sometimes something kind of stands in for the people like this one, um, the two dollar $2 for a photo on the horse, the sign really kind of speaks to an experience, you know, a person might be able to have in this place, although I don't, you know, see any people or a horse, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely about what is, what is the experience about, you know, you're looking at these amazing geologic landscapes, um, what are you trying to feel like, what are you trying to replicate, um, where, where does that, where do those ideas come from? Um, so that's what I've been exploring in this series. Yeah. And uh, this it's one like, does have a person. Yeah. It's like man's, uh, you know, it's like human print imprint on the natural landscape, right? Yeah. There, I think there is a lot of that and it's the stories. Um, like this one is a good example, the Pony Express, you know, this is, this is history, history. This is something that happened during westward expansion, uh, these these might be stories you've learned about in elementary school. Um, you know, there's a lot of legend and lore and western movies and all kinds of things around things that happened in these landscapes. So when you're going there as a tourist, and you know, what is that experience? What are you feeling or learning? Um, so uh, you know, a lot of times it's just the body language of people that I'm interested in, um, as well as the signs and the infrastructure that's in the site. This one was also in the Western Values show. We, uh, where is, where was that again? 
Uh, that's Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, as well as this one. Nebraska. So this is a site on the Oregon Trail that um, people who were crossing the country to get to the gold rush or, you know, the western part of the United States um, would be traveling through and seeing certain um, landmarks and, you know, stopping in certain places. Uh, when tourists go to these places, what there is to see is, yeah, basically those geologic formations, as well as perhaps wagon trail ruts and things like that. And in this case, you know, this is this is a wagon. It's uh, it, it could be an original wagon or 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 replica. Um, there are still a lot of these original wagons around, so it probably is that the Park Service has placed there for people to have, you know, the experience that this family is essentially having of looking at <laughs> something, <laughs> something there that, you know, people like, you know, a family like them may have crossed the, the country in, um, for, you know, early in the history of westward expansion. Without the benefit of the lovely paved road. <laughs> right, yeah. I, there's often the, these kinds of juxtapositions in this yeah. series where there's like something from the past, something from the present, and something about, you know, the experience of it. Um, you know, I'm not sure what these people are thinking, but they all look very interested in, <laughs> or at least pondering to some degree what's going on with that wagon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so this is actually not the West. A lot of my photographs from this series are do take place in the West. This is Niagara Falls. This is, uh, you know, in the East. Um, but it's interesting to think about how the, you know, any frontiers of this country have moved around at, at certain points. Um, you know, this this might have been sort of a frontier area um, as people started did start moving westward. But in the in sightseeing, I wasn't I haven't been necessarily just thinking about it in terms of the West or westward expansion. Um, and I have continued on with this series, you know, looking at different parts of the country. And I, I do want to kind of expand it to other parts of the country. But a lot of it is focused on the West because that's where I live now in Denver and kind of easy to get to these sites. Um, but this was actually one, an early one that really, I think, um, kind of started the series off for me in some ways, uh, because I was just a tourist at Niagara Falls, checking it out for the first time and stumbled upon this little area that was, you know, kind of falling down, kind of off limits. You know, I think I was at the last place where people were allowed to walk there, right. looking towards some area that was being, I'm not sure whether it was being decommissioned or just falling down naturally, but it does, it did kind of just feel like this idea of how, you know, getting the people as close to the falls as possible seems like it was the goal of this stairway. Uh, so, and then there's no, there's no people in this one, as far as I can tell either, but there are the little, um, viewing, um, whatever those things are called up on the yeah, top. Like platform I know it's, oh yeah. above it yes so yeah. the binocular things you can go up to and, and look around so to me that's a bit of a stand-in for you know taking in the view as well as this stairway and that's so yeah this was kind of an early photograph in the series that really got me thinking about you know what is the experience of landscape how why are people so motivated to go to these places um and have the experience and what is you know how is it being sort of shown to us um a lot of times i'm thinking about you know there's a lot of um paintings and um yeah mostly you think of like early landscape paintings that i feel like almost the the sites are sort of set up to give you that view, you know, the, the sort right, of right. Right. I mean, if you take this, yeah. When, when did you take this? Uh, I believe this was two thousand three or four, something like that. So yeah, yeah. it was a yeah. Yeah, with without the um, like without the falling down part, it it this looks this is a, a rather timeless image, right? I right. Mean, like it could have been taken without the without the destroyed part it looks like it could have been taken shortly after it was put in yeah exactly so that that kind of um, romanticizing of the landscape um, and you know putting yourself into it I think is part of the experience yeah 
So I switched a bit in my slideshow here to go back to an older body of work uh, that I was doing kind of concurrently with sightseeing for some time that I would now say I'm not really working on anymore, but I just wanted to show some images from it because it does relate to the West and westward expansion. It was much more specifically about this idea of that particular history, what are the stories and, and how do they kind of affect us now? And um, th these are photographs of reenactment pageants from particular stories within westward expansion that took place within the landscape, you know, where the history happened. Um, and it was a many years long uh, project because I would sort of hear about a reenactment, then, you know, get, figure out how to get there and travel to it and photograph it. So it did take place over over quite a long time, and there's a, a bunch of different reenactments, but it, it I just wanted to show it to talk a little bit about the idea of history and the landscape being, it's still part of sightseeing, I just feel like on a much more subtle level. This is obviously almost like history coming to life in the landscape, which is part of the uh, reason, the re one reason the reenactors, I think, go to the trouble of doing it, um, to have that experience. So this is a this is um, a Custer's Last Stand or Battle on the Little Bighorn reenactment in Montana, and a few more images from that. I don't have these in like chronological order or anything, uh, but I just thought I'd show a few of them. Yes, definitely, and it's nice because I think it it shows the influence this kind of work had on you know on your later work. So yeah, I think um, it. You know, these are so dramatic and so theatrical and you do get you do get that kind of um, almost like confusion between past and present. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> this looks like a scene from, you know, some story from the past, some characters maybe that might have been real or not been real or, you know, something from a movie. So there's a lot of those layers going on. Sure. Um, and I think about that stuff with the sightseeing work as well, but I think it's on a, just a, a much more subtle level. Right. And, and this particular image, um, it's interesting that the, that the, you know, the background as it were, uh, could be, uh, fairly identical to what it was in the time of Custer. So. Exactly. Right. Yeah. A lot of these places that I visit, I mean, this is actually more in you know, like a rodeo, arena and and this particular reenactment was based on more of a legend or more of almost like a pastiche of stories from um this history of uh settlers traveling across the country you know for during the gold rush um perhaps you, having conflicts with the people already there did Were you, you gonna... intentionally leave that uh did you intentionally photograph that either light or telephone pole? Yeah, so what I discovered, this was actually the first one that I went to and I had gone with a writer from Wyoming who introduced me to this whole phenomenon really that these reenactments even took place. So it just, yeah, it's just what you find there. Again, it's a lot, even though it's very intentional, there's still a lot of chance involved. Sure. And that's one thing about photography that I'm interested in in any way is just the level of um, things that are sort of outside of your control sure, <laughs> if sure. you're you know out in the world taking photographs so even though the, these feel like they're staged photographs it's not me doing the staging um, sure, sure and I was always I really do like staged and constructed photography as well as um, you know photography that's more in the moment so to me, this was kind of like an interesting combination of both of those ideas. Um, but yeah, so if the poll is there, the poll is there. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> yeah, and no, I mean, um, and I'm just thinking of it compared to the previous one and even this one, that idea that that um, with the exception of it, it could it could have been a very timeless uh, piece because you're looking at it thinking wow what, like you said when when did this take place right right it's a color photograph uh you know maybe photography had just been invented uh at this time you know this is supposed to be like an 1849 kind of um sure, right uh conflict 
according to legend. The, um, but, uh, you know, so there couldn't be a color photograph for sure. There could barely be a photograph. And, um, you know, so where where's the imagery coming from that the reenactors are putting together? You know, it's coming from stories and Western movies and Western paintings and Western novels and and all, all of those ideas. Um, so this was, uh, so yeah, so I, then I just kept going with this uh, reenactment project and thinking, trying to find re more reenactments that revolved around this story of, yeah, basically the origins of the United States. Uh, so this is the French, uh, French American War uh, reenactment in upstate New York. And, uh, it's, I print these really large because there's a lot of detail in them. So I'm not sure how well on the screen you can see, but there's people in the background um, and there's the there's all the different facets of that war are kind of in this image. There's the French army, the British army, the American army, the Mohawk people. Um, so it's it's kind of all in there. Yeah, I can see the, uh, the background. I can yeah. see the people in the background, so. Good. And this is back to uh, Montana. This is actually a different uh, battle on the Little, Little Bighorn on, put on, on the Crow Agency, Crow Reservation land right on the spot where this history happened. And this is another one where you can see those cars in the background. Um, oh, right. Again, yes. yeah, I might show up thinking, sure. darn it. <laughs> yeah, but in a way, it's kind yeah. of... In a way, it's carrying through almost every image you've shown us that there's this sort of, you know, not necessarily modernity, mod modernity, but this idea that, you know, there's a, a man's, in, you know, man's influence in, in these otherwise sort of pristine locations. Right. Yeah, definitely. The, the landscapes are there and then what's taking place in the landscape is what's, you know, interesting to me. Right. Uh, so I do think even when we go visit these sites without a reenactment going on, this is kind of the experience we're having in a way of um, all these layers of things that have happened there and of time passing. So that's one thing that I liked about these photographs that, that it kind of brought that to life in a way. And I think it might be even part of the reason that people do the reenactments in the first place. Some of the impetus behind it. Oh, wow. The same site. How large is this piece in, uh, in real life? So I print these about, um, the, these panoramic ones are 18 by 48 inches. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I want them to look like West, those big Western history paintings, those big yeah. complicated scenes, because, you know, that's kind of, it's a little chaotic and doing a reenactment like this is chaotic. You have horses, you have guns, you have people running around, you have people playing, you know, all the different sides of the, the conflict or battle. Cause usually these are, are about conflicts and battles. I think that's, you know, something that sticks in, the history and that people, you know, know something about and that there's some impetus to, you know, kind of work it out <laughs> in terms yes. of yes. reenacting it. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking of in terms of the, the finished pieces that they sort of reflect that feeling of looking at a Western history painting where they're also kind of not, you don't necessarily feel like it's the real story. Uh, they, they're going to kind of compress time and put a lot of things together into one scene. So, um, you know, it's, it's not like there was a person standing there painting as it was, as it was happening. Right. But interestingly enough, um, at, just as you said that I actually, as I'm looking at this, it does have sort of a painterly quality to it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would use a lot of uh, longer exposures and let things be a little bit in motion blur um, for that reason. Just, I don't know, kind of get that sort of time element in there a little bit more. Is that, is that an RV at like uh, yeah. 
fuck yeah <laughs> right exactly yep funny yeah in a way it does it it adds a little bit of you know humor to it maybe whether it's intentional or not I think that it's it's interesting yeah I do think it is it's I think it is just to have that layering of past and present and um I mean in some ways you know the reenactments themselves the sort of seriousness that that people take with doing it can almost seem humorous although I'm not I definitely found them very fascinating and interesting and and the people who were involved they're usually local communities who come together on a pretty big scale it takes a lot to put one of these on sure um but you know it's i mean i can see the humor in it <laughs> it's like wow that's a lot of effort to yeah. to yeah. tell that story mm -hmm. yeah so i think i just have a few more of these this is in texas the battle at San Jacinto. This is kind of the um, the remember the Alamo. Okay. Battle. okay. Yeah. And yeah, you just I just kind of show up in whatever's going on there. This one you can see the audience in the background because they're on all sides. You can see some big oil refinery kind of equipment and telephone poles and. Yeah. But again, it's pretty serious. People took it pretty seriously. Um, you know, get the whole story across. Uh. Yeah. Yes, we don't live uh, very far from Lexington and Concord, which is a popular reenactment. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of Civil War reenactments and people often ask me if I do that or have done that. And I haven't. Um, you know, these were really specific to this particular story of the origins of the country and westward expansion and and kind of um, present day sort of notions about it. So I pretty much stuck to that history for this series. Sure. And this, uh, this is Lewis and Clark. Um, this was at a, there was a bicentennial year of Lewis and Clark's exploration. And this took place near the Whitehall, uh, river where it would, I mean, near the, sorry, in Whitehall, Montana, near the Missouri river where they would have been traveling. So, uh, yeah, the red is striking, like the red of their uh, head. Uh, not really a scarf. What is that called? Like a bandana, or a, not a bandana, but like a, like a headband. Yeah, yeah. headband, and then yeah, and then the 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 on the on the right hand side that his red that the figure's red cap. The red caps on several of the figures it's it's interesting your eye gets my eye gets drawn there yeah it's this was right around sunset, so yeah the colors are really Beautiful. saturated and warm yeah. and they had this little set going on in front of those there's those beautiful mountains back there behind the set but then they painted some mountains on the set to sort of give themselves a bit of a stage oh, okay I'm just no I yeah. was wondering what that was I thought it was maybe a structure I see it's yeah. almost a backdrop Right. And then they dug a kind of a trench to be the river. Um, oh, the river is actually kind of behind the audience, but uh, yeah, it would have been hard to do it actually on the river. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. This one takes place in Kansas. Now, some of these reenactments, what's interesting too, since it took me a long time to gather these images together, um, over the years, you know, I'd hear about a reenactment, maybe I'd eventually I'd make it there. Um, but some of these reenactments have, have been going on for 50 years or more, but since I started the project, some of them don't actually take place anymore. So oh. it has become kind of a, a document of this phenomenon as well. Like this one still does take place, but maybe once every five years or so, it's a, a reenactment of a the peace treaty signing where all the Native Americans were being kind of forced to, to um, Kansas and Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, this reenactment, it tells other stories, but that that's the scene that's going on right there. All the people on the right are Native Americans who are coming to sign the peace treaty. And then there's kind of a, a little I don't know, drama. There has to be some drama. So there's some kind of a battle or conflict going on at the same time in terms mm -hmm. of the reenactment. Mm -hmm. So, but this is, uh, yeah, in Kansas. Um, 
in one of the years that it took place. But yeah, so this one just is still ongoing, I believe, but some of the other ones that I've shown don't happen anymore. Um, some, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it has just become kind of an interesting document of the, even though my intent was to kind of get these big dramatic scenes, you know, be the, somehow be the color photographer who showed up at the moment in, you know, the 1800s, uh, it's also a, a, a document of the present day phenomenon. Sure, and, sure. I mean, if they are not going on that. anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. if they're not going yeah. on anymore, you have that historical kind of yeah. Uh, documentation. Yeah. Yeah, so that's been interesting. I didn't really expect that to think about that happening. This is another scene from that same one. And this is... Uh, the uh, meeting of the Transcontinental Railroad. Ah, okay. The Golden Spike, uh, yeah, in Utah. And some, you know, I mean, this is not like a huge reenactment. There's not not a lot of drama. You can see, you know, but some tourists show up to watch uh, a little, <laughs> watch it happen. They do have these replica trains. Um, they will put on a little bit of a, of a drama around it. And I think, oh no, I do have a couple more of these. So yeah, just some other scenes. Again, you mentioned the the humor and I thought this yeah, one was- Yeah, sorry to chuckle, but yeah, I just- The cavalry on the bike path. Right, right, with the with the median and the, and the right. car, yeah. Yeah, so I, I am interested in those juxtapositions. Um, and uh, that's, so that's been something that I usually will capture when I have gone to these reenactments. Um, this one is a, uh, a Santa Fe Trail uh, kind of a living history day at Bent's Old Fort in La Junta, Colorado. Um, people coming to, to take part and play different roles. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to show, this is just what it might look like as an exhibition. You were ask, asking about the scale of the images. This was at the oh, Colorado yes. Springs Fine Arts Center. And uh, this was in uh, Connecticut. Um, so just to give an idea of how that has come together. I feel and like, like oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I feel like, and correct me, and I haven't been to the Denver Art Museum in about, five years now but I feel like that blanket exhibition was there it was yeah that's Marie Watts um blankets mm -hmm. and this was this was long before that uh that came to the Denver Art Museum this was at the Aldrich Museum in uh Ridgefield Connecticut okay yeah your those landscape pieces look perfect there it's like yeah the space for them yeah really nice um, so this, oh, yeah, and so this was uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, and this actually showed uh, some of my sightseeing images along with the reenactment photos. So the there are some connections between the two bodies of work. Um, this was an exhibition about, it was called Continental Drift, about um, different ideas about the, you know, the United States, um, histories of the United States, so both series fit into that. Uh, when, when was this? That was in 2011, okay. I want to say 2012 maybe. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, that's at Robichon Gallery. And that's in, Den and that's in Colorado. That's good, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I thought I'd just go back then to the rest oh. more of the sightseeing photos then just to, to wrap it up. But uh, that, kind of shows my little journey through <laughs> history in the landscape through my my foot photography it's amazing and it's just so beautiful and I don't know you know on, on so many of the other images I'm not I, I don't I am not a student of photography at all but um and I don't know like you were saying earlier if it's just a, a, the length of the exposure but some of them have a um like a, a post an old time postcard feel and I don't know if it's the color of the sky you're capturing or just the amount of sky or the amount of foreground, but they 
they do have this sort of nostalgic kind of postcard feel to them. Yeah, some some of that may just come from these sites themselves. I mean, especially in the West, uh, the look of these landscapes, I think, lends itself. There is all that sky and there is all that foreground. Right, right. And colors do do feel very um, saturated and uh, yeah. It's one of the things I remember most fondly about um, our time in Den in the Denver area is that, you know, even though there are residential areas, you don't have to go far from those residential areas to find views like this. Right, right. And I, this isn't uh, Colorado, but I will say yeah. that one of the, the things about Colorado that I liked the most living there was that, that there nature there nature was still intact in many places yeah. yeah it's interesting how different it can be from either coast uh when right. you're in the middle yes. of the country right with all this space and i think that is one of the draws you know you can see the woman out there standing on the edge of the of the um cliff basically <laughs> um but i think that's one of the draws is just to have that experience of space so a lot of the sites that I've photographed for this series are these kind of in the middle of nowhere, empty sort of sites. Yeah. People do have to travel pretty far. It's like get... Bryce, you know, when you're standing on the precipice at Bryce Canyon and you yeah. think, I am just a tiny little, you know, dot. Exactly. Um, yeah. Similar to like if you're standing uh, on either coast, you know, like when you're looking out at the expanse of the Atlantic or the Pacific and you think, I'm just a, a small little speck. It yeah into the vast vastness of nature before you and it's 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 humbling I will say yeah definitely and I think this also it it also ties back to some ideas about paintings too that tie into this series where thinking of early landscape paintings Hudson River School paintings of American landscapes they often would put a tiny figure or a little house or a little some little man related human related um scene out in the middle of a vast wilderness to yeah to kind of keep us <laughs> in the play make it about us basically um right. you know kind of uh establish our presence out there so oh wow a lot of these yeah i, I do like the little figure in the landscape well it uh, adds that scale too i mean like mm -hmm. compared to the compared to the rest of the whole image, they're just a tiny little, you know, not even an inch high of right. um, taking up space. But interestingly, as we look at it, our eye goes right to that person. And I'm not sure if it's just because of what they're wearing or, or again, is it that yeah. sort of what you were just saying, this idea that we have to always find ourselves somewhere. Well, yeah, exactly. It's 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 all about us, right? <laughs> even right. even in geologic time, right? Yeah. I miss yeah. the. I mean, I think that's what's also so striking, particularly about the very first image that you showed. Um, I could stand in front of that all day, only because of the fact that the the striation of the of the of the side of the earth that you showed, or I guess it's a. You said it was a cliff canyon. Yeah. Canyon, yeah. Mm -hmm. It had both vertical lines, it had horizontal lines, and it was just a, a history of, of our, of our earth. Right. And, um, yeah. I, I, again, it's why I kind of laugh at the fence because it, it's, yeah. you know, but. This one has some, the cultural history in it as well. Uh, this is, you know, not only the tourist and what he's doing, which is waving at whoever's taking his photo, which. I mean, it was me too, but whoever, <laughs> whoever was with him, who was taking his photo, right, right. <laughs> that's who he's waving at. And, uh, where he's standing is, is called, uh, John Ford point after the director of Western movies that oh. were made out in monument Valley in the fifties and sixties. And so how funny, yeah. So there's, that's you know, there's more of those layers, cultural layers kind of packed into that one as well. Right. Like you, th you, you, you sort of get the significance of naming it after, after him, but at the same yeah. time, you know, that prior to that, it had some, you know, yeah. indigenously significant name that we found the need to strip away. Exactly. That it becomes more about, yeah, going out there to make movies than, uh, 
than right. the site itself. Right. right, right, right. Yeah, so there are all those. This is back at Scott's Bluff again. This okay. one I often show paired with the, the people looking at the wagon. Sure. Um, yeah, <laughs> you, you get why. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is, yeah. It's amazing. It, it's funny too, because um, the picture uh, that's also in the show of the young girl looking at the, uh, at the map. Yeah. Um, in 2020, after the, um, after the pandemic, um, we decided, my husband and I decided to leave Colorado and we spent about six months on the road. And, you know, I think back to so many times we just <laughs> We just got out of the car, read the sign, and we're like, okay, done. Yeah, exactly. We saw and, it, got that right. one. <laughs> and we didn't, like, we we took a few pictures, and we're like, okay, it's freezing, get back in the car. But, yeah. to, but had the sign not been there, it still is a magnificent vista that we, you know, very easily could have gotten out and just, and just looked at. And I always remember him saying, okay are you done <laughs> right yeah I know these these tourist experiences can be so many different things it's really amazing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah there's that's a good one for the tourist experience this is a highly underrated tourist experience in the uh, the Navajo Nation uh four corners okay it's four corners of states yeah, it's uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. Oh, wow. Right where they meet. And uh, yeah, it's great, really low-key, fun <laughs> place to go if you're out, in, if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that there's only, you know, one little family out there. What yeah, I think it varies. Photo. You know, you, you see all those benches there. And what's weird is that that's the activity is just watching people interact with this um constructed marker sure uh, but it's fascinating you really yeah. could stay there all day and, and just the yeah. idea too that the that the lines themselves are imparted by you know like by a surveyor or whomever decided right. that's where those four places intersected right yeah and then that there's all that empty space you can see kind of out past it so it is it does feel very arbitrary <laughs> right exactly yes yeah it's... yep so kind of a bit of a street photography project as well as landscape because you know you I'm, I'm always interested in capturing the moment of something interesting going on um but yeah they don't all have people in them but signs often draw my attention um especially when they they kind of set up these juxtapositions. Um, you know, this is this is back to uh, this is Chimney Rock, um, so another, uh, I guess, iconic kind of monument that pioneers crossing the country would have used as a, you know, waypoint. Sure. And uh, you know, but now it, you know it's a site. It's a um, I'm trying to think if it's a national, I think it's a national monument. Okay. So there's pathways and things, you know, you can walk on and stand on and signs, of course, warning you if you go off the pathway <laughs> that um, you might go across you some. You're on it. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the other piece of this is that, you know, we are choosing to, by making things accessible, we are choosing to put people in the way of, of actual nature. <laughs> sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then also just thinking of if you are as you know thinking about it in terms of the history of of what the site is about you know what what story it's uh, telling you know thinking about we have this pathway to walk on and a sign warning us if you were crossing the country or you were living in this area of course that would just be part of your everyday existence something you would have to deal with Right, right. Well, and also some of uh, some of the images that you've shown us also bring to mind this idea, particularly the or not necessarily the Oregon Trail one where the family was looking at the um, the coach, but this idea that um, as people were making their way west uh, after visiting uh, Bryce and and Zion and some of the other um, sites in Utah, I, I can only imagine 
their awe at seeing these structures. Like I, even mm-hmm. as a, a city girl from Boston, like as we traveled across the country, I just was in awe of the yeah. geology of, of the country. And uh, in a way, I, I mean, I'm, I'm heartened that the National Park Service has chosen to, I'm using preserves with air quotes, right? Because there's still a lot of man-made aspects to the parks but I am, but I am, and also in some of them, like even down in Red Rocks in Colorado Springs, uh, it always pains me to see people on them, but I know it's, I don't know, even know if it's permitted, but um, that sort yeah. of idea again about humans interacting with, with that, the geology yeah. of, of our, of our planet and particularly our country. Yeah, I find it, in, the infrastructure itself, I do find it interesting. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't think it necessarily interferes with the experience. Uh, I, I think it's part of the draw, you know, if they're not, if these sites aren't sort of packaged for the tourist experience, no one will, will go to them. Sure, so, right, right. yeah, so it's just kind of the, the nature of it, but I, that is why I don't, you know, rather than try to get the pristine view <laughs> i i like to get the infrastructure in the view sure. the other thing about this one that you were talking about you know n- being from a city or not being out in these sites um the other thing about this photo that i that i like is that there you can see a plane flying over and i think that's most m- more people's experience <laughs> of this part of the country oh i see it right yeah. yes yes i see the yeah. uh Montreal. Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I didn't so. know it after. Okay. But now I'm looking at it. Yes. Right. Yeah. I don't think it hits you over the head, but it's just kind of yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 Oh, ruins. This, these are, these are interesting ruins. Hoven weep again out in uh, Utah near the four corners area. There's a, there's a, a little couple in there. I'm not sure how easy they are to see um hiking around okay yeah but, the ruins that have been preserved um you know i think we find them culturally and historically significant um but i can also understand the 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 need to the need for people to kind of look at them and and think they're they're just kind of in the way of building something new so like yeah, the, yeah this is show has out of the way I don't, yeah, I don't, you know, mining, I think there, it's, it may be more about mining interests out in this part of the okay. country. Yeah. But uh, again, they are, you know, they are preserved. This is, you know, designated as a um, historic site, historic area. Mm-hmm. And this is Mesa Verde. This one doesn't have any people in it. I, I sometimes wish it did, but <laughs> there were people, I just didn't end up liking what any of them were doing. So I ended up going with, <laughs> with the one that had no people. <laughs> so again, back to the chance of it. And I don't know, you know, I think uh, it just, maybe it's nice within the series to have a minute to just kind of put yourself in there rather than see what other people are doing. And yeah, these sites are, you know, these sites are, they're a little, you know, they don't know everything about everything that happened here. It's such ancient history. So. Yes. Uh, this reminds me of the, Mo- is it Montezuma? The Montezuma site? I can't even remember where that this was. This is Mesa Verde in uh, okay. South Western Colorado. Okay. And this oh. is a parking lot in Utah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-uh. So yeah, again, the infrastructure and just the way we get out into nature mm-hmm. on a paved uh, road. Right. This wow. is the Great Canyon, of course. Beautiful. How cool! Because the sky is so dark, it almost looks stormy, but you're in obviously in sunlight. Yeah, it was winter. Yeah, that's cool. 
And back to the idea of, yeah, the path. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that may be my last photo, I believe. Beautiful. Wow. So yeah, this series has been, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I definitely like getting out to these places myself and then, you know, seeing if I can find that moment that fits in <laughs> and tells that story of, you know, something a little bigger about how we experience these places. And um, yeah, then I, then I have another one for my series is basically how it's been working. Well, good. I was just going to say, so do you find so that, so on this, and it's funny when I first saw the title of sight seen, mm -hmm. my brain went to sight unseen. Oh, and I thought it yeah. was kind of play on the words of sight unseen. Um, but I like the sight scene because it's very literally, you know, what you're seeing or what you have seen through the, uh, through the yeah. Web and like you said, you know, that feeling of you, you, you pulled up to the marker, you jumped out of the car, you got the photo, <laughs> you know, yeah. saw it. I did it, checked it off the list, although, uh, you know, not quite on that level, but yeah, I think that's all, all part of it as well. Are there places in the country that you, um, would still like to, to photograph? Yeah, like I said, I would like to get to, I do love these Western landscapes and the the geology. Uh, I am interested in getting to more um, historic sites, um, okay. so where it may be just about a particular history, maybe more so than um, geology. Okay. So uh, that's probably the direction I'll be going in moving forward. Okay. And yeah, trying to, trying to cover just more of the United States. Um, yes. I don't mind that it's really focused on the West right now, but I think it would be interesting to really expand it out across really the whole country. Yeah, I think when we were driving up to Mount Rushmore, we had to go through Wyoming, which I am sure if we spent some time there, we would find something cool and interesting. We went during a time when it was very, um, there were a lot of fires. So atmospherically, it was quite intriguing. Um, but we couldn't really be out in it much. So it was, it was, um, it was oh, very yeah. interesting. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. That I was like, was very if I had more slides or not. Yeah. That's I think okay. I that's, this one's um, one more. that's like, in like that's spiral line. jetty. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that really, really actually fits, but <laughs> it I mean, is, Salt Lake and, uh, there was a person out there, so it worked. <laughs> Yeah, and just the background, the the mountains in the background, and then that horizon line of kind of like a, uh, I don't know if it's, is it, it's obvious, where did you say it was? It's Walk the Great Salt Lake. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. 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 Wow. And Robert Smithson's earthwork, Spiral Jetty. Okay, yes. I was going to say, um, I helped a, a, a artist do some um, sl a slideshow on land art. And I remember this, I remember this, uh, this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very well-known earthwork from the 1970s. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay. This time for real. This is <laughs> why. <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't remember. Yeah. This is a uh, death Valley. Yeah. I think you know, I don't, I don't, I try not to be too, um, there's often people taking photographs, right, at, in these sites, and yeah. it, I think it gets a little repetitive if I have a ton of photographs of other people taking photographs, but I really couldn't resist this one because just everyone out there is doing something involved with photography, um, so I found it kind of, and, you know, in kind of hilarious ways, actually, so... <laughs> Sure. I just had to go with it. <laughs> I think one of our most intriguing uh, experiences when we were traveling was that I think it was either, I don't think it was great sand dunes. I think it was white sands mm -hmm. uh, and we were getting ready to go. We had spent a considerable amount of time there taking pictures and just kind of exploring. And we turned and saw a man with his camel. <laughs> oh. And I thought, I mean, it was like a full-on camel, and that's a photo op for it was sure. The strangest thing, and I just thought, you know, how how cool is that? 
Yeah. Have you been down to uh to Great Sands and Pe Pueblo? Um, the well, I've been to the the Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. Yeah. I haven't been to um, I think is it White Sands in New Mexico? Yeah, near, um, I haven't been there. Okay, but the Great Sand Dunes are yeah cool because you can walk on them. Yeah. And also the idea, I think what I like most about them is that the fact that they are so, um, they're so in motion that, you know, uh, hundreds of people could be walking on them. And then and by the next morning, you'd never know they were there. And I think right. that's the part, it's almost like the etch-a-sketch of sand dunes, right? Because it, it erases the fact that humans felt, you know, we, we walked through them and whatever ski pulled through them or whatever it might have been um but it just sort of wipes it all away with a good wind gust yeah so interesting yeah the other place that was interesting was a place called sunset crater sunset crater is that what it was called i feel like sunset crater maybe in arizona where it is a um volcano that had erupted and they allowed the lava to just remain there cooled obviously cooled wow. and then you could walk along it and i found that to be absolutely fascinating that it was here yeah. in the united states like you know lava or yeah, yeah lava so that what yeah. gets people out <laughs> into yes. the world yeah, yeah. And it wasn't even a. it wasn't even like you know the the top thing we just kind of passed it and i'm like i saw right. the crater and was was drawn to it and uh and 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 for whatever reason we were the only people there so it was it was amazing yeah. really really cool yeah that's a great experience i i enjoy that experience as well although with this series sometimes i'm i'm disappointed if there's no other people because <laughs> then i might you know i, I kind of want to see some other people it might it might make a good photograph so right right but i do enjoy that experience too of being the only one there well these are wonderful and um again, congratulations for having four in the main gallery that's fantastic yeah. And um, this show is up through the 2nd of March. So we would encourage folks to, to um, get out and, you know, you were, we were talking earlier before, before we started to record about um, the lack of, of labeling or um, like, you know, much written word in this particular show for any of the work. And um, and this kind of programming really helps to give a little bit of background, not only about you as a photographer, but about the, the images in your work and how you feel about them. And, and mostly how you, how, I don't know if this part's true, but how you want, not necessarily how you want us to feel about them, but I think being an informed viewer sometimes makes a difference in what you're looking at. Yeah, that's great. I mean, thanks for the opportunity to to talk about it a little further. And uh, yeah, I hope that people, um, if they do want some more information, that they that they that they got it out of our conversation. It was really, really enjoyable to talk with you about these photographs. Absolutely. Thank you so very much.